Hello and welcome to Tatvadi Conversations and Explorations. For a sixth episode on language, we sat down with author Rika Auckland. Ms. Auckland is an American author who earned an MA in linguistics from Gallaudet, the world's only university for the deaf. She began a PhD program at the University of Chicago where she discovered psycholinguistics and her love for it. She first worked in a gesture research lab and later took up with a brain research lab where she conducted the experiments that would earn her a degree in 2004. In 2016, she won the Linguistic Journalism Award from the Linguistic Society of America. She's the author of two well-received books, 2009's In the Land of Invented Languages and 2021's Highly Irregular. In this interview, Ms. Auckland talked about the role environment plays in not only the language we acquire, but how we acquire it. how all languages of the world known and unknown are complete in themselves and led by their own set of well defined rules she also shared interesting insights from the invented warrior language klingon which was created for the star trek universe along with insights on the upcoming generation of linguists we hope this conversation can help the listeners see the tatva or the true essence of their own mother tongue along with the values and meanings embedded within the structures of the different languages of our world and their strong interconnectedness hello ms often uh, welcome to tatpadi hi thank you for having me here thank you for giving us your time i i just like to get started with my guests without wasting any time okay So in order to prepare for this interview I went through a couple of your interviews and uh, I've based most of my questions from there and all these questions I at least I hope will help us construct an essence of language find an essence of language which which people the general public can find it you know easy to understand that's what the goal of the conversation will be let's see how we go in uh, one of your interviews I'm going to quote you here you had said that uh, language like rock formations wind patterns or solar radiation is a thing that exists out there in the world and we should be able to determine the systems underlying it by looking at it in the world with all its messy variation so a lot of interesting things out there but what i fundamentally want to know from you is if you could tell us some of these underlying systems that you're talking about and if they can or if they have told us something about languages um well that comment that is is something i say when people say oh you're a linguist that means you're correcting my grammar or your uh how should i say this what's right what's correct and my response to that is that linguists don't do that they look at language like they look at other phenomena in the world rock formations etc the the task is not to say what language should be but to see it as an observer not interfere with it not judge anything about it just look at it like you would any uh anything in the world if you're a scientist and um and so that is that that comment is inspired by that idea that to turn it around so that the assumption isn't what's correct what's right what should language be and transform it transform it to what is it Now what you're asking me then is so what is it <laughs> and that is very hard to say simply well this is what it is this is what the system is because it is an ongoing project and linguistics as is sort of new as that kind of science in that it, the, the the task of under, of uncovering so what is grammar isn't something that's been settled what we know is that grammar is a system that all languages have and is there anything that all languages have in common is there a universal like they all have this um that we can't even say perhaps something like you know they all have verbs that's maybe but every time you try to come up with something like oh all languages do this you will find some small language in papua new guinea or something that no no they actually do it this way so there isn't 
there aren't rules, the grammar, grammar, particular grammar rule, we can say that all languages do this, but we can say they all are rule governed, rule governed. What we end up doing more is what seems like something no language would do, like random ordering each time you make a sentence. Um, that's probably not going to happen. Random ordering. What exactly? Um, languages generally have either subject verb object or subject object verb or object verb subject. All of those permutations are existing, but you won't have a language where it does it randomly differently every time. However, however, you might have a language that marks each of those things with a with a, an ending hmm. so that you can put it in any order, but you'll know whether it's the subject, verb, or object because of the ending that's stuck on it. So yeah, this is when you get, it starts to be difficult to not talk about it technically um, mm -hmm. because you, you want to say, well, yeah, all languages are systematic, but there will be exceptions. Anytime you say you, you found this rule, there'll be some, some exceptions to that rule too. So it's systematic, but not unable to deviate from whatever system you found. Right. So it's complex and changing, but also um, there are things that are, uh, that would be, there are things that would be surprising to a linguist. And I've worked with constructed languages, languages that people make up, and you can, if you make up a language that's too perfect in its system, that sometimes will seem like this doesn't seem natural. It, it's right. not how a natural language would be. Mm -hmm. So if you try to come up with like a perfect system where the rule is the same every time, right. you know, it will be lang language-like, but maybe sort of obviously not natural language. <laughs> Right. So I think, uh, yeah, we've opened a lot of uh, very interesting points here. Uh, I'll, I'll try to lay them out now. I started suddenly thinking of mathematics uh, in terms mm -hmm. of how it seems to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, how linguists seem, linguists seems to, seem to approach uh, language in the sense, in what sense do I mean this? I mean this, like in math, if uh, a thing is so 99 times, but 100th time it turns out to not be so, that is rejected. So similarly in language also, linguists have been able, have been, have been trying to look for something that is standard or common across languages, but because somewhere or the other, you know, uh, they find something to stand out in a certain language, they cannot say for certain that this makes its present felt across languages in the world. So in that sense, it's a little bit, maybe the approach of linguists is a little bit like grammar, uh, sorry, uh, like a mathematician. A am I right to say that? Well, that... It is sort of an ideal, but language is, we wish language was like math. <laughs> that would make things... Um, the approach of a mathematician, well, not well. language and yeah. math. Ah, okay. Yeah. So you have a hypothesis and you think this is what it is and you found, find counter evidence, you have to adjust. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, you think this is what all languages have. You, found one, you find one that doesn't. Right. And it's pretty likely that that's going to happen every time you think you've got it. But would you say that, that, I'm just thinking out loud here, but flexibility seems to be a common feature that languages share and a certain elasticity, because that's another thing you pointed out as a difference between natural and invented languages. Is it fair to say that flexibility, now that in itself will have so many subparts to it, what kind of flexibility, you know, when it's, is it occurring, how is it occurring, why is it occurring, but just a sense of being elastic and clay-like is something that's common across all languages, natural languages? Um, yes, that, that if you try to say um, like a computer programming language is a language, but it's not a language we can use for human language. We use it for giving instructions in a, in a program, but it's so, it has to be so uh, rule bound that it's very hard to construct a line of code to do what you wanna do. Cause you'll think it says something and then you run it and it doesn't work. And why, oh, oh, cause I, I forgot this only means that and not what I would use. 
but when with spoken language or, or sign language or human language, we can be fuzzy and we can be unclear and we can leave things to context. And not only can we, we have, it has to be able to do that. The language has to be soft and fuzzy enough for us to do the things we need to do it with, uh, do it with it as humans. And that can be frustrating when we want language to be a hundred percent clear. We want meaning to be pinned down and, and for sure, this is what this means. Well, sometimes it's not, you know, sometimes it doesn't. And we feel frustrated when we're trying to say something and we feel misunderstood or we feel the, it's the, our own sense of our own meaning isn't getting through. We think, ugh, language is so hard to say what we want to say. Why can't it be more regimented and clear? But we don't want it to be more regimented and clear. That would make it impossible to speak. So we have to, it has to be, it has to be loose enough to let us do all the things we need to do with it. Right. Uh, I think you captured this essence in one of your statements in your uh, uh, YouTube uh, talk titled uh, uh, Babel Rouses, the 900-year-old quest to build a better language. The, this was, although you're talking about uh, invented language, there's, there's a history to human, where humans have been inventing languages for a long time. And somehow in, uh, in comparison to natural language, which is what your talk was about, that people want to invent new languages because natural languages are sloppy and imprecise, which is exactly what you were talking about. So if we can go further down this road, what is it imprecise about exactly? You were saying that we're not able to pinpoint our thoughts and emotions exactly to that, uh, to, to, to the point where we can be happy about what we have said. But do you think general public really it matters to them it, or, or they come across these uh, situations in life where they feel language is not enough? Once in a while, maybe. But uh, this imprecision doesn't seem to affect the regular guy. No, we don't, we don't see it um, because... Most of the things we spend our days doing are situated in a context hmm. and uh, go according to a script that we know very well and all the people around us know. And we go, I don't have to explain the subtle connotations of my meanings to you because we're operating within the same. A common ground, right? Yeah. Um, but you'll run into it if you're within a subgroup in language. So let's say you um, have a hobby, whatever it is, knitting or skiing, or you'll have a whole vocabulary of expressions that you use within that thing that you do. And when you're with other skiers and you talk about this move or that kind of snow or you, you all know what you're talking about. But when you're not in that group, you need to bulk it up a little more with context and explanation because it won't be automatically understood. And this is why people complain about academic writing or legalese. You know, you read a, an academic paper or a legal brief and you think this is incomprehensible. What are they doing? This, this is an, an abuse of language. It's not, it's not clear. It's not um, common words. Um, but the reason that it isn't is because it's not written, it's written to be used within a context where most people already know all the connotations of those expressions and the whole history of things that have led up to it being said this way. And it's a shorthand for a whole, uh, a whole range of experience that only is understood within that group. Yeah. And and so you take it out of the group, suddenly it looks incomprehensible, but it's not the fault of the language. It's the fault of not being the right language for the right audience. Um, and that's something you have to, you know, you have to adjust to be able to do different, con use your words in different contexts with your own assumptions about what you think people are understanding about what you're saying. And right. that's, something I think most people do run into that not necessarily like the imprecision of thought translating what I want to think into words but the I'm talking about it and I realize oh this person didn't understand what I thought they understood because they're not within the 
the group that that maintains this particular meaning under this particular circumstance. Right, so this is what it feels like now. It feels like, you know, how in college, now I'm, used, I'm, I'm taking the example of my college because that's where I felt it the most, a sense of not being able to belong because of language. So see, when I, I come from a smaller town, I go to a slightly bigger town and I do find my peers, right? But then mm -hmm. there's always this group that you want to know, you know, this the, the, the cool gang, you know. But the lingo is different. Ling the language is different. They're speaking Hindi or they're speaking English, uh, mm -hmm. whatever it is they're speaking. We 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 get the words, but we something is missing, you know, the 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 the, the new lingo that they're generating or they're more open to because of say maybe the American television that they watch. If I have not been open to it, even in my own among my own people, I can feel left out and which is what happens like uh, if it's a legal writing it's only meant for the lawyers for the general public it's kind of cut off but I think I remember talking to a mathematician about this and one of the uh, not about this specifically but about uh, how math because math is about solving problems that's its client so to speak so because it's math, math has been trying to solve problems for so long what has it understood about the nature of problems so what she said is that what mother taught her about uh, problem is that you break it down into simple bits and then you look at each bit containing its meaning and maybe you can be led by the word and uh, you know instead of getting in intimidated you can you know maybe go look for a meaning but i think most of us have this mental block that if we don't speak few of the things that are being uttered so if a lawyer says 50 words out of which Five are the ones I have never heard. Very technical, very heavy, loaded with meaning. I might as well stay quiet, overlooking the fact that I can understand the other 40 or 45. This happens, right? Like unconsciously language, we make language our barrier. And they, the, then it becomes they and us. That happens, right? Words don't have, we, we like to think like words are little containers of meaning. And either we have looked inside and we know what it is or we haven't and we don't know what it means but the word it's not the the words don't have meaning people have meaning right so the same word can be turned around in a social group so that it means something different so if i you know we we know what the word uh, i mean this is an old fashioned example but the word bad it's very, that's a simple, straightforward word. The word bad is bad. Mm -hmm. We all know what that means, right? But in a cool little group of Six. kids, they can decide that's bad. Yeah. And then it means good. Yeah. So it's not, so it's though the people give the meaning to the words. People in communities give meaning to the words. And you can belong to many different communities in your life. So you can use the word both ways. Um, and when people are using words in a community in their own way, yeah, people that aren't in that community might be blocked in a sense or kept out when, you know, if, or if you're using a fancy lawyer word, then, uh, you know, it's not necessarily that you're trying to be obtuse and you know confusing it's that you think you're talking in your group mm -hmm. and you are assuming your group is going to understand because you your group has given the meaning to that word mm -hmm. um but some people aren't in that group mm -hmm. and you know, and sometimes it's it's just uh, an oversight you know forgetting like oh yeah I have to explain this right. <laughs> because I'm not talking just to my group here. I'm talking and I, then I need to open it up more and, and use, you, you, usually it means use more words. Hmm. You know, you can't use shorthand anymore. You have to use longer explanations hmm. using, using words. Cause, cause the groups I'm talking about aren't just like group, 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 group next to each other. They're also layered within each other. So there's, you know, the very small group of the five girls click who uses their slang their own way. And they're within the, the group of the whole school that might use a different language habit. And they're within a group of the neighborhood. And they're within the group of, you know, the groups 
are layered hierarchically. So me and you are not, you know, we're thousands of miles away from each other and di very different places, but we're using a general sort of world English that um, I have a so sort of a sense of what we share in terms of understanding words and meanings. And then I know there's things, you know, I'm a native speaker, so I have a, a leg up on just having more of those things, but I can adjust to not use the things that I think an international speaker wouldn't know. No. Um, and, but that is a, a big group, like that group includes a lot of people but you can lose track of it and then start, I could start using words that, you know, that you don't have access to. Um, and that's a sort of, that's a social skill, knowing how to adjust your language to who you're talking to. And that's one of the fuzzy parts of language in that it has to be able to do that, right? So that's why language has to have loose edges so that adjustments can be made moment to moment in a social setting. And that's something that programming languages don't have to do and mathematical equations don't have to do and things that we think of as systems with rules don't usually have to do. So that makes language different. Right, sorry. I think in a sense it is like in the in case of a computer, lang computer language or um, uh, the language of math, you need to know the language. In natural languages, it seems to me, the language needs to know you to some extent. And you are changing and you are open and you are, and it has room for that. And it's, it's really quite, it's really magical. And it's, it's strange how this is how it developed. Yeah, language only exists between people. It doesn't, it's not out there and then we go find it and we learn it. It only exists between people. Um, it's not in a book. It's not contained in a dictionary that we then go learn each one. We Each one of those things in the dictionary came to life between people. And, um, and that's, that's where it exists. Right. So earlier we were talking about, you were talking about grammar. I think everyone today has, to some extent, and I think it goes across languages, not just English, that there are people who are experts in language. Some of them are very, let's say, protective of grammar. You know, it's like a, it's a rule for them that cannot be undone. The rules of grammar cannot be, you cannot challenge them. You cannot challenge them. What do you think that they're trying so hard to protect? Well, there are, there's language, there's how we communicate, and then there's um, standard language which is a institution that is maintained, upheld, passed down, mm -hmm. and has, has rules that are, that, are, that are, this is the way we do things. And they're kind of like rules like, um, you know, if you're going to have lunch with the queen, you have to know which fork to use and that you don't, you know, you don't just, reach over and pour yourself some more water. I don't know what, I don't know what the rules are for having lunch with the queen, but there are rules, right? And they are, um, if you don't do them right, it'll be noticed and it'll be wrong, but only wrong in the sense of not according to the institution that we've decided that it should be. And, and language rules are like that. So, um, when when I say we, you know, I give you a I don't know, one of the grammar rules when people say a, one, a big one is data. So data, people will harp on. Oh, we don't say um, the data is the data is compelling. We say the data are compelling because data is a plural uh, and it's you have to use. It. Yeah, well. That is the natural way to use it, right? And that's how most people use it when they're talking about data. But you will get it corrected if you're, 
maybe I shouldn't use that one because that one's kind of disappearing already. And now everybody's going to feel insecure about their use of data. But yeah, for a long time and till, you know, till the, I don't know, 40 years ago, any teacher would be marking that wrong. Um, and, but that has changed. Because it is um, the 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 singular in Latin is datum, and the plural is data. And when you're talking about data, you're talking about a bunch of datum. <laughs> but but we've changed the meaning, right? So now data is a is a different kind of noun. It's a mass, like Collective. when we right. If we say rice. We're, we're talking about a pile of grains of rice. We're not, it's a mass, even though it has individual parts in it. And that's how we think of data now. It's, right. it's a mass of little things. Right. Um, so, but, you know, let's say you were in a, a, a science program in 1960, right. you would be corrected on saying the data uh is no no the data are because data is the latin plural of datum and we are talking about many many points of data which is you know that's i've just used it as a mass noun points of data right but anyway that might that might be not the perfect example but what it shows is that you can have a teacher that marks it wrong crosses it out and you yeah you you're in that particular science program you got to learn that rule and because you have to learn to use the right fork to eat salad with the queen yeah. it's the same kind of thing right. but that doesn't mean this is how it this is handed down from god and is the proper right right way to do it because of some you know in the same way that certain rules of gravity or you know rules of math are laws of the universe right. language rules are not laws of the universe and they are not to be enforced in the sense of you have disrespected the laws of the universe they're to be enforced in the sense of you know listen you're having lunch with the queen you should probably know the standards that we know right. so that you don't make a mis a faux pas you know and that's um and so i guess what i'm trying to say is i'm not against having rule teacher rules you know that are enforced like this is how you this is how you're supposed to do it but no one should think if they don't do it they're stupid or they haven't um all it means is you just haven't gotten the fork <laughs> you haven't gotten the fork rules down yet right. and it's something you just have to learn and right. it's not because you don't understand logic right. it's because right. you didn't get the training yet and the training is valuable it's important right. because it's an institution right. if you write for a newspaper you have to use their house style if you're writing a um, a thesis in school, you have to use the institutional things we've agreed on, but it's not because these are the laws of logic. These are the laws of the universe. Right. It's, it's the forks, that's all. <laughs> yes, exactly. And there are so many another uh, set of interesting things that uh, I've picked up from what you were saying. So it seems like this. So yes, so there are institutions which have a prescribed way of communication, of using language, of how language must be used. So yes, you see it in uh, when you're writing your thesis, when you are a doctor, you know, when you're a lawyer, there are, and then people, when the same people, uh, you know, take off the uniform, they're speaking, they have a natural way of speaking and which their family members get, their friends get, and they, they we kind of transition very easily. But what is also coming to my mind is that this instructional way when it exists in schools, say, where I think maybe it's going away because a lot of people have been raising doubts about this form of education. It has had its run, it had, has its merit, it continues to ha have its merit and it probably can improve upon by certain changes that need to be made. A lot of teachers in, uh, 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 that we spoke to in our math uh, series, that's what they said. 
So it seems like when you are at the school level doing this instructional, do the bidding of the grammar thing, you're somewhere taking away the intuition of the child. Because now I'm also thinking another thing, which is bone of contention in the linguistic community, whether language influences thought or thought influences language. It seems to uh, be one of, see, there seems to be two camps, you know, in this. So now when I think of data, when you said the data is compatible or the data is working, whatever, the thought in my brain is, uh, or my my reason for using is instead of are, there is a reason. It's, it's, it's at lightning speed in my brain. Also because, uh, you know, I've been using it for so long now. The fact is that I see it as a collective mass, like it's about uh, the data of tier two city, middle class working families, their income. So the data, it's a one collective thing. It's like how you say average, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. So my understanding of what is presented and then using is instead of are to make my sentence, it makes complete sense to me. You see, and I think also uh, now that data is not just in English, like limited to the English language, it's used elsewhere. Maybe this is in our debate is anyway settled. But I'm saying that there is a way of looking at things that makes you speak in a certain way. Do you think that then fundamentally it's a thought that influences how we speak? The words are habits enforced by um, the people around us. So we we have something in um, in English uh, called um, plur pluralia tantum words. So we have words for things, but we use a plural with them. So um, that but there's there's singular things like scissors. Where are the scissors? Where where are the the tongs? Where are my glasses? Are we're using the plural? And you think, oh, well, it's different than saying, where is the pen? Or where are my glasses? Where is my pen? And then you think, oh, it's because there's two parts to my glasses. So naturally we think of it as plural, plural or there's two parts on a scissors. And that's why we think, um, but, but we don't do, you could say that um, for a, um, a, a bra, right? There's two parts to a bra. Mm -hmm. But we don't say we don't use the plural for that one. Right. Why not? Yeah. Conceptually, we could think of it that way, um, but we, you know, we don't we don't use the plural because that's not the habit of that's not the what everyone else around us is doing, and that's not the habit we're into. So it's not like. Um, because I've noticed this conceptual thing and that's going to make me use that word that way, that is not going to make you use that word that way. What's going to make you use that word that way is the habit of the people around you. But the habit of the people around you can change over time with, you know, so something like data, this is over the course of a century of technological progress where data became more of a mass because we're, we could collect so much more of it and do different kinds of things with it scientifically. Yeah. Um, and so, so over time, um, it can change the way that it's used, the way we think of it. And also that the Latin rule was always kind of artificially imposed because we, because we don't speak Latin, we speak English. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, language Language influences thought, thought influences language, language, but never in a very direct, limited way in the sense of we must, we are bound to think this way because our language demands it, nor is it our language will be this way because this is how we think. Neither of those things are um, completely true. And the two camps language influences thought, thought influences language, or no, there's no relationship. I don't think anyone's completely in, in either of those camps. There's everyone's somewhere in the middle. Um, but, uh, but how, you know, how far toward one side or the other can vary because yeah, languages do, language is a habit. The habit of using the language can nudge you toward certain ways of 
perceiving the world, but not trap you in it so that you, I can't conceive of that because my language doesn't have that. That is not a thing. Right. Um, yeah, so like languages, like earlier, like when we were talking, if you have to, the, right now, if you can list down certain characteristics of language, it seems or through how it behaves, it seems it is, it's a, it's a way of filtering certain things out. It is also uh, because of how it's, how things are conducted around it. Maybe it can also become a point of veneration, like the queen and the, you need to know the code of how to conduct yourself. There's a code. It's not known to you and me, but there is a code. And this uh, other factors that contribute to it, uh, its flexible nature. So these seem to be some of the characteristics of language, right? Inclusion, mm -hmm. exclusion, infiltration, I include both of them. Yeah. So yeah, interesting, very nice. I would also want to understand uh, something you said in, a, in, a, in another interview. You said in writing for a popular audience, I have been saddened to discover a strong, deep undercurrent of shame through the way people discuss language. Now, maybe this is an older interview. I don't know where things stand today or if your own opinion has undergone any change, but could you, could you elaborate on the sense of shame and how did you uh, first realize it? it? It's sort of related to when you tell someone, oh, I'm a linguist and they go, ooh, I better watch what I say. You're oh. judging my grammar, you're judging. And, and that, um, yeah, that, that makes me sad. People are very touchy about being judged on their language. Yeah. But it's because they are often judged on their language and often judged harshly in, in, in various ways. If you're not a native speaker of a language and you're speaking um, with native speakers and you're wondering, am I doing it right? Trying to think of the things you learned. But also if you're you know, all speaking the same language, but your accent is different because you come from a different background. Um, and someone notes it and says, you said that word so funny. And then it's a feeling of shame, like, oh, you've discovered my humble origins or you've, you've discovered my lack of something and that's, or you're judging the place I come from. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that, uh, that's everywhere. Um, but it shouldn't be it, like everyone, everyone speaks a full language with all the expressional capability that people need with, with rules. Even if you speak a, uh, a dialect that is unwritten and that people disparage and make fun of, it has rules that they don't know. And when they make fun of it, they will show that they don't know them because they will do it wrong. This happened a lot with um, uh, African-American English in the 90s. There was a lot of talk about it, Ebonics, called Ebonic, calling it Ebonics because some teachers in California wanted to um, teach it in the classroom. And these people were outraged, like, you want to teach this horrible corrupted version of English with bad grammar. And um, this is the end of our proper education. And why would you do that to these kids? But they didn't want to, the point of this program was not to teach them how to speak it. That's how, yeah. And they wanted to show them, here are the rules of what you're doing. Right. And here's how they differ from the standard language that we're learning. Mm -hmm. And that's a great teaching technique, right? Like here's the system you're using. Here's how it differs from the system uh, that we're learning. And that makes it easier to see what you're trying to learn. But people didn't <laughs> notice that subtlety of it and were outraged. And there were a lot of articles where people tried to make fun of it by writing a whole article in what they thought of as Ebonics. And the irony was they got it totally wrong. Like they didn't do proper Ebonic. They didn't do proper grammatical forms in that dialect, thereby showing that that dialect has rules and you don't know them, which is why you can't do it right. <laughs> um, and that's true of every 
dialect, every disparaged dialect, there are no dialects that like just don't have logic. Like they're doing it so wrong because they can't think because they don't know logic. That has nothing to do with it. It's that they, you know, you'd have to learn these things to learn the system. Yeah, that people's feelings about shame about their own language. I just want to say, you know, your your own language or your own dialect or your own accent or way of saying it is valid. It's it might not be the standard. Maybe, you know, it's probably a good idea to learn the standard for various social economic reasons, but it's not one is not more true than the other or more correct in in the larger sense of logic and thought and meaning than the other. You should you should be proud to say like I can do it this way and I can do it this way like to be able to switch be able to switch in and out of social uh, levels with your language is is a very big skill and you should be proud of being able to do that you can do that it displays a certain amount of a fair amount of intelligence to be able to transition in and out of language like that yes and also i think another problem uh, a factor that uh, i have personally observed in me my husband is like if you know the the, the strings that hold your own language together because ultimately it's for the lack of a better word it comes down to confidence so if some some somebody is laughing at my accent i can probably uh, equip myself to deal with it if i know the strains of my own language a little little bit because it will kind of give me a uh, inroad into what language is so i can say yeah so you know reasons for the accent there are there, there are biological reasons i think for it because of the way how the tongue moves how the throat moves and how certain words you know the air how it leaves your mouth there are so many factors determining all these things and because we are blind to these facts and 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 the person who's making fun of us is equally blind to these facts leads to very unnecessary conflict i think taking your own language seriously your own mother tongue seriously be it hindi be it in india there are so many languages anywhere uh, english or you know whatever i think it can teach us a lot about taking care of ourselves to begin with in whatever situation i guess today internet social media that's the thing and uh, the rate at which people are speaking exchanging information sharing uh, is has gone up and uh, i know that you uh, you've spoken about this before how now the the linguists have a lot more data to work with compared to before this happened the phenomenon of the internet but what i really want to understand from you is what do you think that language is bringing to the world of technology because a whole new language i think had to be developed and what is technology bringing to language itself there's so many ways that these um these subjects coincide one is that everything is so much more uh text based now so when we communicate with each other we are producing texts we are texting each other we're writing on our social media we're writing emails we're writing in comment threads but we're not doing formal writing we're not writing um letters we're not um uh, writing papers we're just chatting in a casual manner but in text which is durable all of human history most languages has dis- most language use has disappeared on the air um and when we study ancient languages we study them by we have these are the documents we can find and that's what we have to go on and that's how we know certain things about the languages of 1000 years ago 2000 years ago but um but but we're limited because what was saved and what do we still have what are the documents we can actually see there's very few of them mm. and as history progresses we get more you know the invention of the printing press and we get more more and more documents produced and more and more documents retained that we can use to look at what was going on in history but still very limited yeah. and now it's it's huge it's 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 still limited in the sense that we don't have access to all of spoken language but this conversation is being recorded and now it's durable 
and now it's evidence of how people are talking. Uh, so now we have a vast treasure trove of, of examples that we can look at and see how is language changing? How is language developing? What do people really do as opposed to what are what do they do as a school, a matter of school rules? You know, what is their natural language behavior? We have so much more durable evidence of that. Uh, that has changed immensely. Um, and uh, that's, it's valuable for the future, but it's also can be studied in the moment. You can look at a, you wanna see like, how is this slang term changed over the past two years? You can do a, a, a big study of it because you have a lot of examples to use and compare and, 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 and look at statistically. And that ha that's a huge change to be able to do that kind of uh, look at language. And the fact that we do casual language in a durable format it doesn't, it's not disappearing on the air anymore and we can look at it. Yeah. That's big. Right. Durable, I get it. But do you think, considering human nature, as far as, you know, me, myself, and from what I've read and observed, when we are under some kind of a spotlight or when we're being recorded, our behavior tends to change because this is very much in context. You know, we're conducting ourselves in front of another person, you know? Who's to say whether I'm like that in real life or not? Cordial, warm, you know, funny and yeah. you know, on point. Mm -hmm. So somewhere, maybe what we'd end up recording, I don't know how casual or how natural it is going to be. Mm -hmm. Because we now know the traits of looking presentable, right? And it's good. You're out talking to people. It's, it's nice to be less savage and more civilized. Yes, I agree. But how natural are we? Because... The, 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 there are so many layers to how we conduct ourselves. Do you think because we are recording, especially like this, that we might lose out on something more fundamental because we might be conducting ourselves in a certain way, which might oppose it, even though slightly a natural way of who we being ourselves? Um, yeah, I mean, we're having a, a sort of formal conversation, so it's not but it's a it's it's natural in the way that I'm not editing. I'm not you know being careful to make sure all my sentences are complete. And I'm I'm speaking as I'm thinking. I'm saying um um all of that's in there, which we wouldn't have had um, examples of forty years ago. Uh, so, but but yeah, we don't. It, it's 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 a little bit uh, artificial, or it's a. A certain we're acting in a certain social manner and it's not the way all social contact is yeah. but now you can get you know there's tiktok videos of people yelling at their kids and people post youtube videos of you know bad behavior on buses and right. uh you know people yelling at each other in the street and um that that's also being <laughs> being given a, a more permanent kind of accessible form that we can look at and say okay how do people how do people yell at their kids a tiktok study or <laughs> something like that um which we haven't been able to you know those are sort of in private things that we haven't had much access to um until now uh so yeah i think the the there's a there's a full range of of stuff being produced and and not even just videos but like um the when my son's playing video games they have a chat window going next to it where they're it, you know it's playing right. around with each other and and doing jokes and responding to each other and to the action which is what in the in the old days they would have been doing whatever activities they were doing and now it's in the text box and it's there it's it doesn't disappear i don't know if anybody's studying that but that is true casual conversation, but in text form. Right. And it, people are used to that to the point where they're not worrying about spelling and punctuation and all these things that in previous decades, if you're putting it on text, you're going to be thinking about that at least a little. Now it's, there's a whole nother mode for doing it in a chat box or a, in a and a social media post. <laughs> it's interesting. So like they have something 
wonderful happening here. So earlier we could only, to a large extent, in order to study language, we had to rely on the edited versions and edited recorded versions of conversations, often formal, maybe sometimes informal. But I think at some point, linguists have turned their attention towards uh, how language takes place in the social context. I know one uh, linguist, her name is Deborah Tannen, Miss Deborah, we were really trying to get in touch with her also. So she kind of also started to focus on how it's naturally spoken among friends. So yeah. here, linguists had, let's say, I don't know if it, the right word is the upper hand, but they had the, the advantage of reflection. Something has happened and I have time now to study it. Right mm -hmm. now, that kind of reflection has to be right now. Like you're studying it as it is unfolding. So uh, while you have a lot of data, do you think in taking away this uh, form of reflection, any now while talking to you, I'm understanding the, the kind of the heavy duty burden that's on the shoulders of linguists to keep these things in mind that, yeah, we are watching recorded conversations and, you know, people might be, might be being themselves, might not be being themselves. And then we have to understand how they are constructing things because we are going to send out theories out into the world. So we have to be careful, but also this, uh, they call it a captain hindsight or something like this power of reflection now being taken away to some extent, is it going to, the, 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 the way you will approach language will change as a linguist, uh, how you will study, it will change. Do you think this, this is a nice time to know that once you could reflect, and now the reflection has to be much more immediate. You don't have all the all the time anymore. Uh, in a way, yes. I I think. I mean, you 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 do have time. You don't have to you don't have to study it just because it's happening now. You know, there's things we don't notice that are happening now that uh, in. 80 years people might look back and say oh how did this change into this let's go let's go look at the record yeah. Yeah. um and we don't even know what's happening yet because yeah. we're in the middle of it you know um but i do think a danger is that uh, we have so much more computational power right. which we we need because of so much we have so much data not just in language but in everything um, and you, you can't sit there and manually deal with it and count it out. There's too much of it. So we have amazing statistical techniques for pulling out what, what does this mean? What's going on here? And it's these amazing statistical techniques let us do things like, you know, gene research and, and brain research and everything. Uh, and when you apply them and they can do things with language too, you can take um, all the books on Google and uh, use the text in that to pull out some meanings. You can see, uh, patterns. you can, you can, yeah, you can look at patterns by using these statistical techniques, um, but they, they can be distracting from looking for, Con real content what's really going on here because it's there's some things that are very easy to do like counting words so maybe you know if you want to do something like how happy is this country versus that country and now we're going to count up all the happy words and then we're going to say well this country's happier um, because it's really easy um, to do that like look at the individual words but to do that, first you have to decide what what is a happy word. <laughs> like we said before, the word we have this word bad, and sometimes it means bad, but sometimes it means good. You know, who decides? I'm gonna say these are the words on this list. These are happy words, and these words are sad words. And I'm gonna count them all up, and I'm gonna say this this national character is sad because they use so many. Words. That that kind of thing is is dangerous, yeah. and and just not it's not very deep and it's doesn't really take into account the complexity of language but it's so easy to do those kinds of things that people people want to crank them out um because you can just plug it in and um but language is a lot more than individual words and like we talked about before every word is in some kind of context and within some kind of group and the groups are nested within each other and the group you know and um i think people because of the this wealth of data and these amazing techniques, people can get lazy about 
digging into that complexity of um, what's what's going on and those interesting questions that do take that into account are much much harder to do so um who's going to do them uh there has to be you know right. it's good but it's also kind of dangerous in what it allows you to get away with <laughs> right i think that that was really interesting you are the first uh, linguist we're speaking with the only one i think who's going to be in the series who's also studied invented languages mm -hmm. and um in the same 2015 talk, you list down, starting from somewhere in 12th century, that people have, maybe it could have been earlier, maybe it's not recorded, who knows. But since then, people have been interested in inventing languages. And it seems like the, the need to invent a language maybe was also saying that what we have, the current system of language does not work. It's a strange claim, but something probably inspired them enough to say, I'm not just saying it, it's not enough, I'm going to do something about it. So here is my uh language so somebody made a, 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 a language which was like a prayer then people uh, also tried later on also tried to invent another language where it was more conceptual so they had uh, uh, used numbers to denote different concepts so they wanted to say life has concepts and the language which helps us speak through about these concepts must be a good language then the, the, the people who wanted to express universal truths through their invented language. There are those who wanted uh, to maybe bring about world peace as the founder of Esperanto, he, that's what his hope was. And so there are, and then there is someone who said, I'm going to make a language. This is all through your talk. And I've just tried to see the, the way it has flown, I'm trying to understand where we, what all this means that someone created a language which was I don't know, that was the most interesting it should be all logic so that when people speak, maybe they'll speak logically. But that must be coming from a real personal experience, I think. So he went ahead and did this. <laughs> so what do you think now, after all these people, they've had their uh, you know stint with inventing languages, what do you think is the purpose of language? Or is it right to say what should be the purpose of language? Language is a social function. It is a way of interacting with the world and also with things that aren't in the world. And I think that makes humans very different. We don't have to just talk about what's in front of us and we don't have to just talk about what we want or what we need. We can talk about imaginary situations we can talk about the distant past we can talk about things that have never happened that expands our thought and our, allows us to think very abstractly um, the story of invented languages um, is one of the humans have this urge to engineer when there's a problem kind of come up with a solution like we need a uh, we need to protect ourselves from the cold and that that so here's our solution we're going to build this structure and and then over time the structure gets more adapted to what we need and humans solve, solve problems like that and people over the centuries have tried to do that with language for the problems they saw language is not logical enough it causes wars because people don't understand each other it stops us from thinking logically. All these reasons that you mentioned, people have said, well, I'll make a language that doesn't do that, but it never works <laughs> because the tool that we use is not the cause of those problems, if they're even problems. And the end of invented, the end of the invented languages story, the, the, where it ends up is people still invent languages. It's a very popular hobby now but they do it for artistic reasons. You know, Tolkien is the prime example of this. He created a world and wrote his books in that world that doesn't exist. It started with a language that he started working on. He was a philologist. He loved the sounds of Welsh and he loved these grammatical structures of Finnish. And he was very knowledgeable about Scandinavian languages and he just connected with those things artistically and created in his mind a sort of ideal language that combined all those things he loved and he worked on it and he worked it out 
then created the world that that language would exist in. And that became the Lord of the Rings. And that became the world he created in fiction. He wasn't trying to cure language. He wasn't trying to solve the world's problems with his language or solve our way of thinking with his language. It was a personal artistic vision that he brought to life. And that's a good enough, that's a good enough reason to invent languages too. And that's what people, most people do now, creating languages for fictional worlds or for thought experiments. What if there was a you know, group of people that had no vocal cords? What would their language sound like and or look like? And how would it work? And it's, you know, and then you they work it out and they come up with something. You study Klingon, you speak Klingon. And uh, what are some of the most beautiful and distinctly uh, Klingon ideas that you found in this, in this language, in this invented language? And do you think these ideas, you would not have found them if, if you hadn't found Klingon? <laughs> Uh, well, I don't speak Klingon that thoroughly. Um, I learned it more as a sort of a, a grammatical challenge. Like this, it's a very, very difficult and very uh, unlike English. So learning it is sort of like trying to learn. I don't know if I tried to learn Basque or something. That would be very difficult for me. <laughs> it's kind of, and it, but and it definitely had that same kind of feeling to it. I wouldn't say there's any beautiful concepts because it's made to fit the Klingon fictional culture which is not about beauty at all it's about warrior culture with there's no way to say things like I love you <laughs> and, 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 and Klingon the way to say uh, hello is nuknek means what do you want <laughs> so it's there's no there's no politeness yeah. <laughs> but people have fun with it and they've even they translated Hamlet into it right <laughs> and it's a real full translation, which is very interesting because you try to translate Hamlet into this warrior culture language. You, at one line, Ophelia says, uh, I must go pray now. Klingons aren't doing praying. So they translated that line as, I must go do calisthenics now <laughs> because they, they do you know, robust exercise as a form of- uh, That's their prayer, right. Same things you would use prayer for, I guess. So it's, it's, it's funny, it's interesting, and it's very creative, the way that people use it and what they manage to do with it, this made up difficult language. This inspires a question. I don't know how well it will be, but Klingon, it seems to have a personality when you say, what do you want? Now, what kind of person mm -hmm. says that? Like from my understanding, either you're too busy and uh, you really value your time and you don't think people will uh, you know, appreciate that or that you don't like company. I don't know. There are so many reasons that you might just, hello, instead of, you know, what do you want, mm -hmm. right? And also assuming that if somebody is breaking into your space and time, so to speak, there's something that they must need. So just cutting mm -hmm. to the chase, cut to the chase. So do you think that languages that way have uh, personalities? I know they say French is beautiful, Tamil is, is, is beautiful, um, yeah, and it's very it's it's very personal though. Like some people just fall in love with particular languages for whatever reason they become interested in it. It's a hard thing to capture because it is very personal. I don't think we can say, oh, oh yes, French is a much more lovely, elegant language because you can do all the same ugly things with French that you can with any other language. <laughs> and you can do beautiful things with, with other languages. German and you yeah. can do any language. So it's reductive to say like the <laughs> national character is like this because this is what their language is like. But, you know, definitely cultural habits are reflected in language. Japanese has all this politeness uh, grammar. You, you have to mark verbs for where you stand in social relation to other people. And there's a very complex system of politeness expressions that if you're uh, becoming fully conversant in Japanese, you need to know those ways of speaking in order to move through the society in a polite way <laughs> or in, in a way that the society values so so yeah those things yeah the language will reflect what's important to the people who are speaking the language that doesn't seem surprising you know that's it's sort of like yeah of course it does uh, once you know it like that yeah 
you've studied sign language also i do not know i haven't studied sign language but it's very interesting it seems really interesting and uh, what i would like to know from you is what do you think that sign language can tell us about language fundamentals yeah what it tells us is that language is more it's something different than the physical form it takes place in language is not dependent on sound it's not dependent on hearing it can, and language take can take place in a mod, any modality that humans can perform and receive i can see then i can have a language based on the fact that uh, of my sight and if i can if i can't see and i can't hear i can have language based on the sensation of touch uh it's not bound to the physical form that it takes place in it's a way of interpersonally making meaning and agreed upon meaning and doing it in a way that becomes systematic and bound by rules and that that's doesn't have to be in speech and it doesn't have to be in sign it it, it just has to be in some form that can be perceived and performed by humans but any time you have it it's going to have language properties there's going to be agreed upon motions or sounds or anything that that creates a form meaning bond that's agreed upon among people and as this group uses it that agreed upon bond between form and meaning will become systematic and then once it's become systematic it's a language whatever whatever form it's taking place in the tricky part here is agreed upon meaning because we end up uh, i was just having this chat conversation with another with a philo- philosopher of language dr mitchell green and we did discuss that how we lose each other at interpretation i think language is standing on a lot of unspoken things rules are known but uh, language itself is standing on a lot of uh, uh, unknowns i mean i don't know it seems like it because we end up just running into conflict so often with people maybe not everybody but uh, it generally in the aggregate what we hear conflicts and altercations happen when we just we don't either we don't know how to convey ourselves we get either carried away by emotions because if we get carried away by emotions maybe our parents can understand that he's he or she's just being emotional right now don't pay heed don't take seriously don't uh, you know a problem further but out in the world it's it's different we can't take uh, th- that much we know that we can't take the same liberty with our language and our how we conduct ourselves out in the world but yeah i'm re- i find this agreed upon meaning i think is a big uh, room for improvement i think yeah, I, yeah? yeah? okay uh, the last question i'd like to ask you is uh, what would you say are some of the inquiries questions that you'd like the younger generation of linguists uh, to carry forward yeah i don't think i need to direct them at all there's a, a, the newer generation of linguists i think is much more open to questions about um language as a social function mm-hmm. and i think that's uh that's where it's at the way that we interact uh with each other and the way that we interact with the various groups that we all participate in mm-hmm. and how that changes and how we adapt our language to it and how we make meaning with systematic uh form at all these different levels at at different times and in different ways um they're doing a good job of it <laughs> so awesome wonderful wonderful to hear that with that we'll uh, end our conversation here miss offner it was so much fun so interesting to get to know uh how you approach language and how language has um you know opened itself to you in so many different ways so thank you for your time really thank you for your time for your generosity and uh, i really hope both my husband and i we really hope that this series of conversations on language we do not know what form shape or effect it will have but if to begin with we can start taking a mother tongues seriously you know the language we were born into seriously and say see that it is based on something just because we get to use it so easily you know doesn't mean it it's uh, wobbly you know yeah it has its imprecisions and sloppiness but it's also yeah. very stol- solid so thank you for that yes yeah <laughs>
yeah, well, thank you for having me and giving me a chance to talk. My conversation with Ms. Auckland shed light on how language shapes identity, how shallow and misinformed our rebuke of those is who don't speak our language or not in the way we are used to hear it spoken. That language today is as much an art form as it was a tool for hope and change not so long ago. It will be wonderful to know your thoughts on this interview and if it inspired your worldview in any way. Thanks for being here. I will see you soon with another interesting mind demystifying another interesting topic. Until then, take care.